Today we're going to be studying Mark chapter 7 verses 1 to 13 for proper 16 in series B, the series that is primarily dedicated to Mark's gospel. And I'd like to welcome you back to Mark after three weeks of an excursion into John chapter 6 as we do in every series B during the summer. Many thanks to Dr. Gieschen for his expositions of John chapter 6. If you remember, before we went to John 6, we um, did two passages from Mark in chapter 6 uh, that had to do first with the feeding of the 5,000, and then the other passage was Jesus walking on the water along with some miracles. And if you remember, I, I did the passage of the walking on the water, and I talked about this sacramental matrix from um, 6.30 to 8.26, and that it's all about the bread. And it's the fact that the disciples do not understand the bread. And so we are picking up immediately following upon the, the miracles that take place right after this walking on the water of healing, where it shows that Jesus is the healer and the word that is used there is saved. And now we're going to come to a section here, uh, Mark 4, uh, 1 to 13, where we, we basically introduce a new group. And you can see them here. They are the Pharisees. Some of the scribes, and they're from Jerusalem. And what we're going to see is that the Pharisees and all of the Jews here, it says, here are Pharisees and scribes. So you got a little bit of a kind of a frame here in this section. Or this is not, it's not a frame. It's actually the introduction in the next section. Apologize for that. Here, let me erase that. Anyway. You, so you have the, the section beginning with the Pharisees and the scribes, and here I, you begin with the Pharisees and the scribes again. I, I would like to say this, and you can take this for what it's worth. These scribes are leaders of the, the Pharisees, and they're from Jerusalem. And you know that the, the Pharisees and scribes are known for being outside Jerusalem. And so these people are probably from the school of Gamaliel, and, of course, Paul was the all-star pupil of the school of Gamaliel. Could it be that at this point he was a scribe, a leader of the Pharisees? Could he be part of this delegation that is coming from Jerusalem to witness Jesus' teaching? Um, I don't know. It's, it certainly is within the realm of possibility I think we can certainly say this, that when these scribes from Jerusalem returned to Jerusalem, Paul was privy to their report about Jesus. So there's no doubt that Paul knew the teachings of Jesus and was completely, totally aware of everything he was teaching. And that really, in some ways, as Jesus is teaching here, he's teaching against Paul which is one of the reasons why Paul might have been as incensed against the Christian church and, and, in fact, became not just a persecutor of the church, but responsible for the deaths of many Christians. Now, I've highlighted here already some of the language of eating. And notice this eating bread. Bread, there it is. Not eating, not eating. Now, this is, of course, in connection with what we're going to see are the traditions of the elders, and that, of course, is the law. Most of you are familiar that at this time, um, there was a discussion, of course, between Jesus and the Pharisees. Jesus was a person who was focused in on the written code of the law, the Pharisees, this oral tradition. This is what this is. It's a super position upon the Torah, the written code of the law, uh, that interpreted it in a way that was the way of the gospel instead of the way of Christ. In many ways, this whole section is to understand that Jesus is the bread 
and that the Old Testament needs to be understood in terms of Jesus, that it's all about Jesus. And you can see here that the question is a very simple question that is directly related to the purity code. And here it's in connection with hands that are dirty, hands that are being baptized, and other things as well here. Um, and it's very important to see that this is a very important thing in the written code of the law, who's clean, who's unclean, what is holy, what is not holy, who's in and who's out. But the Pharisees, for their own benefit, for their own benefit, and oftentimes it was for the sake of money, which is why Jesus calls them lovers of money, have superimposed on the written code of the law an oral code that is a yoke, as Peter says in the Apostolic Council, that not even our fathers were able to bear. So this whole thing sets up this confrontation now to see a Pharisee controversy with Jesus. And if the disciples were clueless, the Pharisees are the ones who are maybe not more clueless, but more hostile to Jesus and everything that he brings. So the first part, in a sense, sets up the situation here with the traditions of the fathers and the, the unclean hands. And really the disciples here, they're seeing the disciples are defiled, you know, common. This is the word for common. It's where we get the word for the koine, the Greek koine, common. They're, they're defiled. They're, they're unclean. And <clears throat> there's going to be this controversy between Jesus and the Pharisees over this Pharisaical interpretation of the purity laws. Now, <clears throat> that brings us to the second part of the text. And the second part of the text is, uh, again, where we, we see Jesus sort of critiquing them by means now of the oral tradition of the word from Isaiah. Not the oral, the written tradition. Excuse me, the written tradition. Again, we have the Pharisees and the scribes. They're accusing the disciples of not walking along according to the tradition of the, law, of the elders. This is the oral law, the law. And again, it's so great to see this coming back again and again and again. You know, because they, their hands are defiled when they are eating the bread, the bread, the bread. Here it is again. Now, Jesus calls them hypocrites. This is a word that he uses of the Pharisees. And let me try to give you a little sense what I think. This is certainly true in Luke's gospel, and I, I'm sure it's true here. But a person who is a hypocrite is somebody who builds a facade because they don't want to reveal who they really are. And for Jesus, one of the reasons why a person is a hypocrite is because they are afraid. And what are they afraid of? They're afraid of confessing the true faith. And the true faith is, of course, Christ. And Christ in the Old Testament, Christ who clearly is the bread. And he is the, 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 the source of all purity. He is the source of holiness. When one is in his presence, one's clean. And all these oral traditions about hands, about, about cleansing, baptizing, vessels and the like, all that goes out the window when you're in the presence of Jesus. And the, the, the Pharisees are putting an undue burden on people. Now, this facade that they create is a facade of piety. It's a facade of the law. And it's the way in which they see, you know, their way of being saved. This is an alternate means of salvation. It's the way of the law. Alternative. 
to the gospel. And it, of course, is no gospel, as, as Paul says in Galatians. And the way in which they build this facade, and this isn't necessarily going to come through in this text, but I'll just say it here, is by means of the use of their money, their possessions. They build this facade of piety and stand behind it because they are afraid of confessing what I think they know from the Old Testament, that Jesus is the Messiah. Now what's so interesting here in the, the passage here is that it's all about honor. And it's about honor, it's about worship, and it's about them teaching doctrines that are the doctrines of men. And here's the important passage right here. I'll put it in thick green. Maybe it's not. Yeah, no, it's not. The commandment of God. And here you'll see it begins the next pericope, the commandment of God. Now, what is this commandment of God? This commandment of God is, of course, the commandment of love. Love God, love neighbor. And instead of just simply going with these two tables of the law, loving God, loving neighbor as oneself, they have superimposed, where are they, the traditions of, of the, the elders. Um, they have superimposed this, and here it is again, and we saw that before, they, this oral code of the law, and it has become a terrific burden. Oh yeah, here, the traditions of men, it's called here. You know, and, and it's this juxtaposition between what is the written law of love that Jesus fulfills in his death, and here's where you would preach the gospel, that all of this comes to its end in Jesus, who is, in a sense, you know, killed by the law because he fulfills it in loving his neighbor as himself, and we are his neighbor, and he brings it to its perfect fulfillment in love. The Pharisees have no idea that this is what it's about. Now, this last section is the most difficult, and it's one that I think many people struggle with a little bit here. Um, and it's because it has to do with this, this um, idea of korban. And korban is a very kind of obscure thing. We don't see it often in the New Testament. It's not in Luke's Gospel, for example. But let's look at, at what's happening here to, to get into it. First of all, we start with the, the commandment of God here. This is Jesus now speaking to them again. And, um, and the commandment of God is reflected here through Moses. And here you get the fourth commandment, the first commandment of the second table of the law, love your mother and father. And, um, and it's, it's kind of Jesus taking them back as he did above, right here, taking them back to the Torah, to the written code of the law. And what has happened to them, and this is, this is really quite fascinating, what has happened to the Pharisees is that they have, they have lost their way in terms of what is most important. And instead of taking care of their parents, fulfilling, honoring their mother and their father, fulfilling the fourth commandment, they would rather engage in korban, that is gift. And I think the best way to, to think of korban here is an offering that is above and beyond the tithe of the Mosaic law. And instead of doing what the law says, the basic love of parents, they would rather instead let their parents sort of waste away or die or not be taken care of so that they, and here's that facade, they may stand behind this a facade of piety by giving this korban um, instead of taking care of their parents. And, and it's a great example of where they've, they've switched, you know, what is fundamental to the written code of the law with something that is the oral code of the law, and that is this korban. So what they're saying is, 
that korban, these special offerings, are more important than supporting elderly parents. And this is obviously here self-serving, it's a sham, and Jesus, of course, calls it hypocrisy. And it is the ultimate hypocrisy. They don't understand clearly, in a sense, what they're doing. And so Jesus comes back to describing it as the Word of God, taking them back to the, to the Torah. And, and as I speak here of Torah, I'm always speaking of it as law and gospel. I'm al always speaking of it here as a living word, the viva vox, ye the viva vox Jesu, that is fulfilled in Christ. And we come back to this language of tradition, and as, as some of you know, it comes from the word paradidomi. And paradidomi obviously can mean tradition to hand, hand over the faith. And here I think that's how it's mostly being used, the tradition of the elders, the traditions of men, you know. Or it can mean betray and becomes, as you know, a shorthand for the passion. And in a way, what the Pharisees are doing here is they are portraying the true tradition, which is a Christological reading of the Old Testament and understanding that the, the, the fundamental understanding of the Old Testament is through the law of love, loving God and loving neighbor, and are replacing it for silly things like korban. Okay, let's summarize here a little bit. How do we preach on this text? What do we do in order to get this text to be understood as gospel? Well, Let's take it back to that idea of they do not understand the bread. And what we have here is an example of the Pharisees who have come on the scene now. And we're going to talk about the leaven of the Pharisees later on. I don't know if that actually comes up in what we're going to be studying. But the leaven of the Pharisees, of course, is related to the bread. And... I would focus on the fact that when you are looking at what is holy, what is clean, what is pure, you must see it all in terms of Christ and not superimpose on the written code of the law. And Jesus cites it twice superimpose on the written code of the law anything that distracts from the reality that Christ is the bread of life and that he is the one who comes to make all things whole, make all things clean. He comes to restore all of creation to himself. That he is the one who is not just a fulfillment of the law, but shows us how to understand the Old Testament, the Torah, in a Christological way. And really, when you, when you come back to this, this whole thing here um, of understanding the, the first part here, as you go back to the eating the bread or not eating because of your hands and the like and the, the defilement, we, we, we can't get away from the fact that what the, 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 the Gospels are talking about is this, in Jesus, this incandescent breaking in of holiness. Who is holy? Who is clean? Who is pure? Who is invited to participate and eat the bread? It's anyone who confesses and believes that Jesus is the bread of life, that in him there is honor, in him there is cleanness, in him there is love. And so there, there's a, a wonderful opportunity here to help your congregation to understand how important a Christological reading of the Old Testament is. And in this week, we rejoice in the fact that as Lutherans, we have this radical Christological hermeneutic 
in the spirit of Jesus, in the spirit of Paul, and in the spirit of the apostles and the apostolic church.